Geoengineering is the deliberate and large-scale intervention in Earth's climate system, usually with the aim of mitigating the adverse effects of so-called global warming. The most prominent subcategory of climate engineering is solar radiation management. Now, solar radiation management attempts to offset the effects of greenhouse gases by causing the Earth to absorb less solar radiation. And this is by screwing with the albedo effect. Almost all research into solar radiation management has to date consisted of computer modeling or lab tests. And an attempt to move outdoor experimentation has proven quite controversial. Now, some methods of greenhouse gas removal, such as ocean iron fertilization, are forms of climate engineering. Ocean iron fertilization has been investigated in small-scale research trials in the actual ocean, folks. Now, these experiments have also proven quite controversial. The World Wildlife Fund has criticized these activities. Now, most experts and major reports advise against relying on climate engineering techniques as the main solution to global warming, in part due to the large uncertainties over their effectiveness and side effects, and also unforeseen consequences. However, most experts also argue that the risks of such interventions must be seen in the context of dangerous global warming. But what is the context? Well, let's take a look. Here you're looking at University of Alabama Huntsville satellite-based temperatures of the global lower atmosphere, which almost all climate scientists agree upon. But the current global temperature as of June 2020 is only 0.43 degrees C above baseline since 1981. And that we've barely even risen a degree in the last 100 years. Now put that in context. What you're looking at here is the Holocene. So this graph goes back about 17,000 years. And if you take a look at this red circle here, this little black blip up is the last 150 years since the Dalton minimum and the uptick. That is global warming. Not this rapid increase in temperature of over 30 degrees 11,500 years ago. That's not catastrophic, I guess. Well, that actually is. And what I'm trying to point out is if we actually look at the last 50,000 years, the global warming blip here is insignificant. It, it, it's insignificant during the entire Holocene warm. And it's even more embarrassing when you look at the last ice age, the last eccentricity cycle, right there. You can see from 50,000 to 10,000 years ago, temperatures fluctuated every few thousand years up to 30 degrees. And that's what happens during the bottom of the ice age. During the interglacial, when it's warm, temperatures barely moderate. And we even had a time period here where temperature changed up to 8 degrees on Earth around 8,000 years ago. 8 degrees in a few hundred years. And we're worried about a half a degree. Or even a degree and a half in a few hundred years. As being catastrophic. Does that seem less than genuine? Well... Coming out yesterday from Rutgers, geoengineering is a solution to fight climate change, but not by itself. And let's just read what they have to say. Could we create massive sulfuric acid clouds that limit global warming and help meet the 2015 Paris International Climate Goals? Well, I guess we could, but it's certainly not going to help anything. Creating massive sulfuric acid clouds is probably bad for the planet. And so even suggesting this nonsense, based on what I just showed you, is st stupid on premise. And what I just showed you was 
the amount of actual catastrophic climate change that has occurred recently and what they're claiming is catastrophic climate change. Even this 8,200 year cooling would have eliminated most of the people on the planet just 8,200 years ago. And then the warming, which occurred shortly thereafter, would have also done the same. But this little blip, you've got to be kidding me. So according to Rutgers, we need to ruin the planet to make it better. Now, I find it interesting that we've gone from geoengineering to climate engineering and now to climate intervention. This is the new word. This is the new flavor. Remember global warming to climate catastrophe? Similar. But climate intervention is one of two things. And I laid it out in the beginning. It's either removing carbon dioxide through sequestration or solar radiation management where we reflect the sunlight back into space. So those are the two sides to the bargain. Now, the funny thing is that recent papers have come out that prove that Earth will not immediately call, cool off even if we slash emissions to where they want them. Here's the paper, Delayed Emergence of Global Temperature Response After Emission Mitigation. So even if we were to suck all the carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, killing the planet and the plants, the temperature wouldn't change. In fact, this paper suggests that the temperature may not change at all, ever, because they don't know if it will. And it may be decades before it even shifts. So why are we trying to reduce carbon emissions? Anybody's guess. Let's look at some of the other cockamamie ideas in the world of geoengineering. How about space mirrors? How about we fire trillions of tiny aluminum mirrors into space to deflect sunlight? Well, what could go wrong with that? We could just invent a giant space vacuum to suck them back all up if it goes awry, I guess. How about climate-ready crops? I think Monsanto's already working on this. Creating paler crops to reflect light. Well, that sounds highly nutritious, doesn't it? How about we paint the whole planet white? What a great idea. These are actual ideas from scientists, by the way. Artificial trees. These are giant, well, they're not trees at all. They're giant <laughs> antenna or some type of chemical reactive tower that literally sucks plant food out of the air, which is going to kill the planet. Here's another funny one, biochar, they suggest. How about we burn the agricultural carbon? Isn't, aren't we trying to stop burning? That just, I, that doesn't make sense. But it makes sense to me, biochar, everyone should be burning all of their leaf and material, fermenting it, and putting it into their soil. That's just good farming. Cloud seeding's been going, going on for 50 or more years. I'm going to put it at 70 years. It even was attempted back in the 1800s and worked. And this is ongoing worldwide. Ski resorts pay for it. Other communities pay for it. Your tax dollars pay for cloud seeding all over the U.S., all over the world. So that's already happening. But there's some good things coming out of this. Now, Germany, because of the whole global warming scare, is using algae to eat carbon in nuclear reactors or even chemical plants. You can scrub the emissions using the algae and feed them that carbon dioxide, which gives you a great algae product. If they could be making spirulina or something like that, this is a win-win. So there is some good things coming out of this. The one thing that's not coming out of this is changing the climate ever by humans. It's just not in our purview. And yet another study confirms the ecological benefits of carbon dioxide. In the middle of the global warming scare, a bunch of climatologists went out, and even NASA confirmed this in a paper, that the Earth has been greening. Yeah, Earth is greening. And here is the paper. Impact of CO2 fertilization on maximum foliage cover across the globe. Increase in CO2 from 1982 to 2010 led to a 5 to 10% increase in green foliage cover over the earth. So global warming increased CO2 is what we should call it, not global warming, leads to the greening of the earth. But the New York Times, in the middle of the global warming panic, 
had to say, no, it, it, it might sound good, but in the long run, it's terrible. And they even got a scientist to back them up on this. The best messages are positive through all of this. CO2 increases crop yields. The earth is greener. And this is all just in the last three decades. But that's very bad, according to the Wall Street Journal. And, and he says that we really don't know about the threshold. At some point when we hit 500 parts per million, plants will stop eating carbon dioxide and it will dump it all on the planet and we're all going to die. That's what this scientist says. As more carbon dioxide gets into the atmosphere, the problems will grow. There's strong evidence that quantity will be effective and quality. It's not clear what happens, but it's going to be bad. I mean, please read this article. It's almost embarrassing. The greening of the planet will not last forever, according to this scientist. There is still a lot Dr. Campbell and his colleagues do not understand about global greening. Well, I'm about to explain it to you, so stick with me. Maybe they could have called me. Most importantly, they do not know how long it will last. Oh, my God. We're almost at, we're approaching 400 parts per million in some areas. Oh, how long will it last before we all die? As temperatures rise and rainfall patterns change, plants may stop soaking up carbon dioxide. A scientist actually said plants may stop soaking up carbon dioxide. And as carbon dioxide increases and there's more plants on Earth because it's got more plant food, he thinks the plants are going to be full at some point and stop eating. He says there's a wild card out there. Well, he's the wild card because he's an idiot. And I'm going to show you why. You're looking at 600 million years of CO2 data. And I could bring this to you because I'm a paleoclimatologist and I know this like the back of my hand. And this dashed line is the current CO2 level. You could see that all of geologic history has been well above that except for a short respite during the Carboniferous and the Permian. Now, plants emerged on Earth back in the Silurian, sometime around 430 million years ago. The first grasses appeared. CO2 levels were 5,000 parts per million. That's a lot higher than today. Exponentially higher. And yet current scientists that are fear mongers are telling you that if we come up here, every, the plants are going to die because there's no evidence scientifically that plants live when CO2 is at 5,000 parts per million, except there is. There's overwhelming evidence. Let's talk about the Permian through the Jurassic. This is when CO2 was around two to 3,000 parts per million, you know, Jurassic Park. The entire planet was covered in cycads, ferns, and conifers to a level which is ununderstandable. There was so much biomass on the planet, it in fact created what we call the coal measures. Most of the coal we harvest through strip mining and the destruction of Earth is from this period, the Carboniferous. Because there were so many plants and so much biomass, we have coal. And this was when CO2 was at two to 3,000 parts per million. Let's bring it a little closer. As we come in through the Cretaceous, now let's go to the Cretaceous here. When CO2 was from 2,500 to 1,000 parts per million, that was the range during the Cretaceous, we had the evolution of deciduous trees. Here's some fossils from New Zealand's Cretaceous, and here's our present-day deciduous trees. So when CO2 was between 1 and 2,500 parts, 1,000 and 2,500 parts per million, deciduous trees evolved. That means that trees like maples, oaks, elms, ashes, all of those deciduous trees will flourish on Earth if the CO2 goes up. Once CO2 hits 1,000 parts per million, that is the environment when these trees evolve. If it goes up to 2,500 parts per million, these trees will flourish. 
They will not die. They will not stop eating CO2 because it's plant food. Now, thankfully, some scientists have a brain. The American Geophysical Union says no to geoengineering. Not until there's lots of testing. The position statement on climate intervention is the same as ours. No. No way. I can prove to any so-called climate expert with my scientific background that they know not what they talk of. And I just proved it to you. These shills, corporate paid charlatans, are a danger to humanity, to life on earth, and to our future. And thankfully, the AGU agrees with me. Humans are responsible for the release of carbon dioxide. But climate intervention requires enhanced research, consideration of societal and en environmental impacts in the short and long term, and policy development. Now, if we jump back to the paper that we started on, and that's going to be the Rutgers study from just yesterday that was released, the Rutgers suggestions. <sighs> There's a lot of bad things coming from academia, and none of it is using the precautionary principle or any of actual science. This is all pushed through political agenda for control over you and the planet. Just like Monsanto leaked 15 years ago in a meeting of the board of directors, they want to own all life, and they don't care at what expense that comes. They want to patent life, which is illegal, by the way. And they already have. The world we live in is a disgusting cesspool of corrupt idiots. The more corrupt and the more stupid you behave, the more money you get and the higher your power. <laughs> but the moment they start geoengineering, and I know you all think they are on a large scale. Now, the Rutgers paper suggests that we could come together as a planet, and the UN could set the protocol for geoengineering and climate engineering, solar radiation management, and all that good stuff. But it also suggests that if we were unable to come to a consensus worldwide, large multinational corporations could take it in their own hands and start geoengineering themselves without asking anyone's permission for the benefit of the planet. It sounds like genetically modified organisms to me, right? Feed the earth, give everyone autism and diabetes at the same time. It's a win-win. Hope you got something out of the video. We live in a shithole. We call it earth. I call it idiocracy. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't. Share this important scientific information with like-minded people. All the links will be below. If you have any pertinent, real science questions, I'd be happy to answer them. The mainstream will not answer your pertinent, real science questions. They will print propaganda ad infinitum until they do whatever they're going to do right in front of your face. It's a disgrace. Click on one of these links as they show up around you. Support the channel and check out what we've been publishing in the last few days. Thanks to all of our one-time donors, our Patreons. And the most important person is the person that shares this video. Be safe. We love you. And that's a boom. Oh, yeah.